We're happy to have with us today, Mesra Bardarin, who is a professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. Uh, this discussion could not be more timely. Uh, I first came across her work uh, some years ago now uh, in connection with her discussing her book, uh, The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. Uh, this was uh, prior to the recent uh, tumult in our society, uh, but I thought then that this was a uh, timely work that couldn't be more important that shines a light on what is perhaps a linchpin of the persistence of racism and racial inequity in American society. Uh, so there's no better guess that we could have uh, than this expert uh, in the role of back, Black banks and wealth and wealth disparities and how uh, these factors influence or relate to uh, ongoing racial inequality. Uh, the structure of the program today is to have our guests uh, make a brief presentation uh, to lay out some of her ideas, and then we'll have discussion and Q&A uh, probing and exploring some of the provocative issues she raises. I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for having me and uh, for allowing me to, to speak about my work. Um, as you said, I, I uh, had hoped um, it would not be as relevant as it is ongoing, but I knew that these are long standing issues and unless you affirmatively fix them, they don't go away naturally. And, uh, you know, I, uh, have said before, you know, I, I finished the book, the book is a you know, eight to 10 year project and I was finishing the book um, leading up to a, a Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. And I um, had to do the last several rounds um, after I knew that it was not going to be a Clinton, you know, it was a Trump administration. And it actually, um, I, I, I had to change it quite a bit because I, I um, was expecting that we were uh, going to be in this ongoing moment of having, you know, some of those colorblind myths still perpetuating. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, the cover kind of the blew off of that a little bit, um, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, uh, in, in, in the last uh, several years, but, you know, with the campaign. Um, so I, I, um, I'm gonna share a few slides, if that's okay with you. Um, and I just wanted to um, give, get some numbers out here. Um, so can you see this uh, racial wealth gap slide? Okay, um, so uh, the book uh, basically it, it's it's about about black banks, but I use black banks to talk about the racial wealth gap and and show the role that credit policies, economic theories, and banks um, have in uh, creating and perpetuating the racial wealth gap. As you can see, you know, uh, um, wealth is not income, and actually, uh, the higher um, in the income scale you go, the wealth gap is actually deeper between black and white families. Um, and, uh, you know, it is it is got not abated over time. So this slide is post-Civil War, uh, black uh, families combined had about 0.5% of the nation's wealth. That makes sense. This is a, a, on the eve of emancipation. Um, today, that number is barely budged, it's about one to 1.5%. Uh, and um, so to say that our public policy efforts to eradicate the wealth gap uh, have been a total failure is an understatement. And and um, one of the reasons I, I think that uh, one of the obstacles that we have is that um, the, is the myths that we tell about markets that present these obstacles to closing the racial wealth gap and achieving economic justice. And the one of the myths uh, that I focus on, and I will talk a little bit about, um, but is, is a thread running through the book is the promise and premise of free market capitalism is that it does not discriminate. So free markets offer equal opportunity for all to trade and prosper based on one's skill and ability to produce. So whether you're a critic of uh, capitalism, like Karl Marx, who says, look, money doesn't see race, money doesn't see individual individuals, or Adam Smith, a proponent, a booster of the market who says, look, free markets can eradicate discrimination based on, you know, someone's ability to produce. So, so on both sort of sides of the free market debate, you do have a sense that it free market is, is uh, uh, judges people based on their you know, market value. Uh, yet uh, American history has revealed that in fact, markets do discriminate or alternatively that the American economy has not 
borne any resemblance to a free market. Uh, for most of our history, uh, Black communities, Black men and women, have been excluded from occupations, schools, neighborhoods, and trades. And their property, and this is important uh, because we're at a law school function, the property has not been protected by the law, certainly not to the extent that uh, uh, white property has been protected by the law, but sometimes in collusion, uh, law and paramilitary violence has been used to deprive black men and women of uh, property. Uh, and this goes deep into, and not just, you know, property as in uh, house, housing and, and, and real real property, but also a patents, patent uh, applications and a corporate property has not been protected or granted by law. And that is very much a place that the law is um, incredibly active and, and uh, judges the parameters of, of wealth is, is uh, inter integral to the law. Um, uh, moreover, at, at each historical moment when wealth was being created for a large middle class, um, whether through the Homestead Act, FHA mortgage credit, uh, you know, GI Bill, uh, uh, grants, Black communities were shut out of that wealth accumulation by design. Um, and at other pivot points in history, uh, specifically during Reconstruction and the Civil War, where there was a clear um, demand for state intervention and capital uh, to remedy past injustice. With Reconstruction, it was clearly the, the injustice of, of enslavement of hundreds of years. And during the civil rights moment, it was the injustice of Jim Crow and segregation and, and you know, ongoing uh, de deprivation of the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments. Um, at those pivotal moments, the rhetoric of free market capitalism has been used as a weapon to cut down those claims. So first Andrew Johnson and then uh, Richard Nixon as presidents riding on a backlash of um, uh, anti-Blackness. Um, and in those moments, instead of real reform, the Black community was offered sort of a self-help mar uh, market of segregated banks and businesses. Uh, in, in other words, leaders upholding the dominance of white market institutions promised that the free market would fix the problems that had been created by law and backed by private violence. Uh, so, uh, you know, the book goes through this history and shows that insofar as the levers of power were held by uh, a white dominant uh, uh, power structure, and the economy was based on racial subordination. And by economy, uh, I mean the labor economy during the plantation uh, slavery system, then the uh, debt cre credit economy of sharecropping, and then third, the mortgage market and the credit market, uh, which were clearly based on uh, race-based uh, risk analysis for mortgages. That insofar as those things were true, that the market itself would perpetually block uh, black capital accumulation. Uh, so during Reconstruction, for one, uh, uh, the freedmen were expected, of course, to make the transition from being capital to being capitalists. And uh, of course, the Southern slave economy, uh, enslavement was not just a labor system of exploitation. It was also a system of capital. Uh, slave, uh, 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 slave holdings were used as leverage to gain credit for other markets. They were the basis of the currency of the South in every way. I mean, this is literal currency, but also the currency that is the, 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 the wealth of the South through, um, you know, bank packaging of loans through insurance markets, through credit markets based on uh, the capital of, 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 of the, the slaves themselves, not just the labor produced by uh, um, uh, enslavement. Um, and so on the eve of emancipation, uh, freedmen and their abolitionist allies demanded land as a form of reparations. And of course, as a punishment for the treasonous Confederates. Uh, without land, they reasoned freedom and justice would be meaningless and participation in capitalism would be a farce. Uh, yet President Andrew Johnson vetoed the land grant bill of the Freedmen's Bill um, and, and most of the other provisions, except for one, which was the Freedmen's Bank, which I'm not gonna go into right now, but uh, it's it, the, the tragic story of that is in the book. Um, and he reasoned during his veto that, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, when he, uh, in his written veto, that the freedmen would be protected by the free market and contract law, that they would just bargain for fair wages and buy their own land. Uh, so this was either unbelievably naive or incredibly cynical. Uh, my guess is on the latter, because Andrew Johnson was very clear that this would be, quote unquote, a white man's government. 
Um, the Southern economy was nothing like a free market. Uh, whites refused to sell property to Blacks. Southern legislatures, lawyers, and judges drafted laws governing every aspect of Black labor. They restricted uh, Black men and women from skilled trades, and vagrancy laws were pre prevalent. Wages were capped by law and by cabal between the employers. And the violations, of course, led to convict labor, which was the caveat of the 13th Amendment um, uh, that reinstated uh, enslavement. Uh, for prisoners. Um, by the end of Reconstruction, the freedmen were left landless, voteless, and with practically every profession blocked to them. Their only choice was to grow cotton. And of course, that was the point. Um, the worldwide cotton market was heavily dependent on cheap and abundant cotton from the United States. This was not a southern uh, uh, just a southern market. This was a northern ind industry market. This was a Liverpool market across the world, cotton exports and trade. And that was used to the, the low stable price of um, cotton exports from the south. Um, and uh, for, for that to happen, for that price to remain stable and, and not skyrocket, um, freedmen could not be landowners. Uh, the, the shadow hanging over Reconstruction was, of course, the Haitian independence uh, revolution. And in Haiti, uh, after independence, the former slaves refused to grow sugar and output halted. They grew crops they could eat instead. That is what people do with their own land. You grow a little bit of subsistence crops as a rational market decision is, you know, half or three, three fourths to subsistence and then a little bit for the cash crop. If everyone grows the cash crop, it's a debt system. The prices for the cash crop are low, but you don't have sometimes in low markets enough to eat. Um, so uh, there was every reason to believe that freed American, uh, 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 the freedmen would also go this route. Um, so in the meantime, the federal government was of course actively providing free land to the private railroad for expansion across the West and uh, through the Homestead Act as well. Um, so uh, black men and women, the freedmen were not denied land because the government was constrained by laissez-faire economics, uh, but because uh, the worldwide cotton market was uh, insistent on uh, the low price of cotton. And of course, instead, uh, free, uh, uh, the free slaves got a bank, uh, which was said to be just as good as land, it would teach thrift and savings that, quote unquote, the freedmen should earn the land and not receive it as a gift. So this idea of deservingness and um, uh, personal responsibility was present at the dawn of uh, emancipation. And of course, over the next, you know, um, uh, decades, um, at the the rights written into even the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment were eventually um, uh, taken away, and um, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, in outlawing uh, Civil Rights Act, for example, of 1875, um, the Chief Justice wrote, you know, it's been 20 years since uh, emancipation, it was high time for the freedmen to stand on their own two feet and stop being treated as, a, and I quote, as the special favorite of the laws. As so already the charge of reverse racism was being uh, uh, charged, you know, 20 years after slavery, this is during heavy sharecropping, uh, where lynching was, uh, coming back up, the Klan was uh, using all sorts of uh, uh, de de depriving, let's say, Black men and women of their uh, due process. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip, actually, because there's a lot of history here that I won't go into. But um, the essentially, the, the color line of that last century uh, was um, the North-South divide. Um, once the Great Migration happened and, and Black populations went North, I know this is like a huge skip in time, but I um, don't have a lot of time uh, to, uh, to go through this. So I'm gonna go to the, um, the New Deal, which essentially um, cements into law the trends that were already prevalent um, in, in the North. So uh, moving away from the South and to the North, the North is where um, housing segregation was, uh, um, innovated. It, that was where it started um, as uh, northern, uh, as uh, black families moved up to uh, these segregated uh, cities. They, the the um, white neighborhoods um, blocked uh, those home sales in those neighborhoods. And and actually, what what would happen is the first black family that would buy into a block paid a premium uh, to 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 buy there and had to face all sorts of uh, riots and and bombs and and violence. And then uh, the once a neighborhood tipped about five to 10% into black homeowners, then that property um, values declined. And so the New Deal um, uh, made uh, these segregation patterns explicit. Of course, that wasn't the point of the New Deal. Um, Roosevelt 
point was to restructure banking and credit markets through heavy state intervention uh, and, and did in a, an incredibly successful system uh, between 1933 and the 1970s, hundreds of thousands of small community banks, credit unions and thrifts are formed. They're safe, stable and profitable. And the reason these small banks thrived, the reason why the George Bailey Bank is, you know, gone, gone down in legend is because the New Deal essentially takes the risk out of banking. Uh, deposits are insured by the FDIC insurance fund, loans are subsidized by the FHA, the GI Bill, the farm loan programs, and all of that secondary, uh, uh, the, the mortgage market is fueled by Fannie Mae and the secondary market, uh, the, the um, exchange of, of mortgages. And all of this built the American middle class. It created intergenerational wealth through home ownership and low cost higher education. So it is not as though middle class men, uh, and it was mostly men, uh, all men, um, it was not that middle class men got those mortgages. It was that the mortgage program created a middle class. You had, you know, workers in the city, both of whom earning the same wages. If you got that $35 a month mortgage in Levittown, then you could, you know, you became middle class. And if you didn't, you paid $50 in the city um, for, you know, uh, a tenement. So the, the way that the New Deal built the middle class uh, mortgage market is through um, redlining. And I won't go through it because I know that this is, uh, uh, more, um, well, when I started writing the book, it, it was, there weren't that many redlining articles and books. And so I went into it a little bit, but, uh, I could, I couldn't really give it justice. And so there's a lot of other resources out there, but basically it's important, you know, to note that the, the these maps were created by these HOLC appraisers who used census data and elaborate questionnaires to tag basically every neighborhood in the country based on risk. Um, and the number one indicator was the race of uh, the people in the neighborhood. And you can go on this website called Mapping Inequality and look at any neighborhood you want. And what you see is, you know, uh, sometimes explicitly, you know, black people, Mexicans, you know, Japanese people, mostly black was the sort of the, the, the high watermark for, you know, uh, uh, high risk neighborhood. And that's where uh, you see red. And then, you know, you see, sometimes they'll say things like subversive races or racially inharmonious or something like uh, not exactly um, uh, that. So this is the Atlanta neighborhood. This is the actual 1934 um, uh, HOLC map of this neighborhood in Atlanta. And any, uh, I use this neighborhood because this is, I, as you can see from the map, it's the best Negro section in Atlanta. It was one of the better best neighborhoods um, in the country, um, uh, largely middle class single family homes, which was the highest mark for these HOLC map makers. This is where Morehouse and Spelman are, Atlanta University time. And the, you know, if you look at number two, the favorable influences are all there. Um, inhabitants, you know, this is black uh, business and professional men. Um, and then you look at foreign born families, zero percent. And then uh, you see infiltration of, right? So that uh, line E, how many people are close by to this neighborhood? So how close are the black uh, communities nearby? And of course this neighborhood is a wealthy black neighborhood, single family homes, and it's redlined, which meant that there were no more mortgages available. Not that you had to go to the private market. This was a you know trillion dollar mortgage market all subsidized by the FHA. There was very little in private mortgages to be made um, at this time. There were some, there are five black banks that were doing it from 1934 to 1968, um, but mostly it was all just that, that credit union uh, savings and loan uh, fueled mortgage. Um, so, so this really um, uh, creates a, a, not just a segregated uh, economy that lasts to today, but also, you know, lots of legal uh, reasons to keep, um, uh, black families outside of your neighborhood, right? So you could do it through signs. At first you did it through mobs and bombs and all that stuff. And then you can just use the law. Uh, so you have, you know, racial covenants, which we, we all maybe study in our property classes or uh, contract classes, but you know, these racial con uh, restrictions are in basically every contract. It's malpractice to sell a home without this in the deed. And it runs with the land and it says, you know, no property, you can't uh, impart to any person or persons not of the white or Caucasian race, right? Um, you see this in the, um, so any person of not of the Caucasian um, race. So these were, um, uh, the FHA encouraged builders to make these loans and, and, and uh, to the extent that your development, if you wanted, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, loans um, from the FHA for your development, it couldn't be close to a black neighborhood either because of that infiltration point, right? You, you, you really marked um, the parameters. And so you had, you know, walls going up and you had real um, incentives um, to keep uh, 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 the neighborhoods uh, homogenous. Um, so, you know, as uh, this, of course, uh, you know, uh, grows the American middle class, the white economy grows by leaps and bounds. Uh, and of course, as you know, white flight leads to suburbanization, the businesses also leave, the you know, roads are, are created, environmental hazards are put in the black um, spaces and, and everything in American life starts to correlate with your zip code and your location. So your, your school taxes are funded by you know, property taxes, the, the, the availability of, of good healthcare, of the buses, you know, of parks, um, all of that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, I um, don't think I have the time right now to go into it, I, I will, but um, this um, system starts to be looked at during the 1960s. And, you know, obviously racial covenants, the Supreme Court decides that those are not uh, enforceable after the civil rights laws. Um, but the civil rights laws, the uh, civil rights law, voting rights law, um, are passed in 1964, uh, 65, 66, you know, those three years are moments of progress, but really what those laws do is um, enshrine uh, or make serious the rights already granted in the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment. They basically deregulated um, the market. And uh, Johnson and, and all the other sort of principles, Lyndon Johnson and the principles of the civil rights laws understand that the last sort of uh, thing that needs to happen here is the um, housing issue. And, and Johnson passes the Fair Housing Act in 1968. And of course, Nixon comes in at that moment. And, and again, you know, not quite as explicit as Andrew Johnson, but really um, is very explicit about this is, we, we, we will not, there are two ways to fix this are, you know, integration, which is uh, the Fair Housing Act contemplated that, or reparations, which is what the, you know, some of the black separatist groups and others were saying. And, um, uh, it's a really fascinating conflict, especially given where we are right now. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the Republican Party, led in part by Nixon and in part by George Romney, who's Mitt Romney's dad, who you know says things like, "The this is a quote from George Romney says the white suburb is a noose around the black ghetto." He says um, that the the government created it, white society is implicated, and and that white society needs to fix it. Uh, Nixon, he becomes a HUD. HUD official in the Nixon administration and is promptly removed because he's trying to push integration. Um, the, 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 the result is that this hasn't been fixed. Um, George Romney ends up being the last HUD of official who actually does active um, integration. Um, since then, the rhetoric of the market being able to fix this sort of thing is, is really um, honed by you know, Nixon, Reagan, and others. And, uh, the charge of the FHA is left. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, the Supreme Court stepping in later on in, in the 80s, and I, I can go into it more, but um, really blocking any racially based um, programs uh, that really halted any progress that even Nixon would have done. Uh, is that you can't actually um, uh, do a program based on race. And, and of course, um, the zoning laws uh, that are blessed in the 1930s through um, the Euclid case, but um, ongoing is the, you know, you don't actually, you can, you can't say, you know, uh, uh, you can be explicitly racially exclusionary, but you can um, limit, you know, affordable housing or, you know, duplexes or, you know, even um, multifamily dwelling um, from, from neighborhoods. And so there still is this um, legal um, uh, perpetuation of the segregation pattern. So that, um, that is, uh, I'll stop and, and take questions if there are any. There are more questions, no doubt, than we could have time to address. That was a, a fabulous uh, presentation and a, <laughs> um, it was a whirlwind overview of, of what could be days of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you so much for that. Uh, let's start with some, some broad questions uh, and We'll start with the history and then we'll move to the, the present. Uh, and, and let me note initially that the, uh, I think you're, you're unquestionably correct that the question of resources is at the heart 
of, of racial inequality today uh, and that we've been having this conversation about resources uh, literally since the end of slavery. Uh, and it's also true that there's been resistance to redistributing resources or giving uh, the free slaves and their progeny the resources that they've needed. Uh, my favorite example is, is one that you were, were in the territory of, which is uh, um, the uh, veto by Andrew Johnson in the aftermath of the Civil War. He vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and echoing the language that would come later about the Negroes wanting to be the special favorites of the laws. You know, he essentially said that, you know, we've ended slavery, like what more do they want? Uh, <laughs> this is going too far. Uh, so even within a year or two of the end of slavery, uh, we had resistance to redistributing resources. Uh, so let me ask you a question about um, that dynamic. Um, you talk in the book uh, in ways, uh, you, you talk in two different ways it seems about the reliance on um, wealth creation, black capitalism, black banks. In one sense, it seems that some people genuinely believed that you know, black capitalism or uh, you know, an infusion of resources into the black community, that that was a way to promote racial progress. And then in other places, you refer in, in a sense to the reliance on markets and capitalism as kind of a cynical maneuver, if you will, uh, that people didn't really expect to work, but they used it to divert attention um, mm -hmm. from black uh, uh, agitation. Mm -hmm about advancement. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about those two different approaches to mm -hmm. uh, capitalism as a means of equality, the cynical approach and the genuine approach? Yes, uh, okay, so there's there's two, um, there's a lot in your question. So the first is that there were two cynical approaches. Um, <laughs> what, you know, one being uh, Nixon's black capitalism, like, and, and the Friedman Bank, I think, mm -hmm was a genuine approach. I think, you know, the Freedmen's Bank was the, the, the Republicans, you know, the union, Sherman and Otis Howard and, and, and the good guys uh, mm -hmm. saying, well, you know, we can't get land, but we can get a bank. But essentially that uh, ends up being, you know, a, a failure. The cynical, I mean, Nixon saying, you know, uh, let's do black capitalism. That is because he doesn't want to do the other things. And so that, there are those two cynical approaches. But as far as, um, there were good, um, the, the good approaches for uh, uh, black banking and black businesses. There were many, I mean, and uh, you know, go in through the book, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. There is not a single black leader, mm -hmm. um, except for two economists um, who were not fans of black owned banks and black businesses. The mm -hmm. two economists are Abram Harris, who's the first Chicago, the black economist of Chicago in the 1930s. And then Andrew Brimmer, who's the first black Fed uh, board governor, who are saying this is not going to work for the reasons that you know I, I, I cite to them because they they knew they saw how banks work, they see how the economy works, and and they say, but those are not the the leaders of the community, you know. But if you're looking at you know Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or Du Bois or B Booker T. Washington, there was this sense of well, you know, you're operating in heavy Jim Crow, you have a discriminatory market. What choice do we have? You know, there's the what choice do we have, like the necessity, the banking out of necessity. And then there's the banking out of protest, right? So you see this, you know, Martin Luther King starts the civil rights movement in, in the 50s, taking his case to Ebony you know, Magazine and saying, we need to have, you know, credit unions and banks as a way of boycott and, and really, you know, using your money to take it out of the system. And, uh, you know, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott was an economic boycott focused on political change. And I think of and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X would both have, have seen it that way. Um, you also have you know, the Marcus Garvey strain, which is we're just gonna create a separatist economy. And that was very much um, uh, in line with the anti-colonialist thinking. Like if you're gonna segregate people and put them in a colony, then we should have our sovereignty as well, right? Sovereignty and, and, and corporations and, and banks. Um, and so those are good nature, they're for black progress. Um, and, and I think it just turns cynical when white policymakers say, okay, do that, right? Um, instead of real reform, um, you go ahead and have your own separate system without any um, help or, or money or uh, connection to the mainstream economy. And, and, and so this is where I come in as a banking uh, mm -hmm. uh, perspective and say, banks can't work. You can't do basic 
money making. Banks can create money. They can do magic uh, by lending. It's not actually magic. It's fractional reserve lending. But to the extent that you're outside of that mainstream economy, that money is going to flow out. And that is what the economists who study this throughout time and, and what I try to kind of heighten that message have said is you can't, not only can you not grow wealth, but you can't even keep the money inside of that market. Right. So, so is the implication then mm -hmm. that the, the effort to promote Black economic advancement through uh, some form of Black banking or Black capitalism, that that kind of has it backwards? That's trying to use the banking system and the economic system to promote advancement, whereas mm -hmm. you're arguing that you really need the advancement to come first, and then the institutions can flourish. Is That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, Booker T. Washington has a uh, famous uh, charge where he says, you know, and this is in the 1900s. And he says, if a black man, you know, owns a mortgage on a white man's house, mm -hmm. the white man can't help but respect him and, and will give him political rights, you mm -hmm. know, and and I think he's earnest in, in thinking that he says, you know, if you if you have to walk to the, the best rail car, then you will, the race will gain respect. So if you can get economic power, it will naturally lead into political power. Um, and you see that, it, in fact, it doesn't because you don't get cut into the, the FHA. You don't get the Homestead Act. And sometimes in, in situations like Wilmington, Delaware or Tulsa, you actually get the mortgage on the white man's house and then he you know, creates a mob and and burns burns down your house and the bank and 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 doesn't get the um, uh, the law um, punishing him because that that is the the way that white supremacy worked at the time or and and still does to some extent. Right? This is a really provocative point. Um, I, and I'm going to go back to some some more historical points, but let me stay with this for a minute. So, what do you make in light of this analysis? What do you make of the great emphasis we've seen in the last many months, frankly, since the killing of George Floyd on black businesses and promoting basically some mm -hmm. form of black capitalism, uh, something that people weren't thinking about a year or two or three ago, but they're really thinking about now? Are those efforts misguided? Are they helpful? Are they part of the problem or part of the solution? You know, um, I tell there's two stories here. So, so I helped. Netflix came to me and said, Netflix, you know, they're doing all sorts of great content and documentaries and say, we want to put in the money that we have routed through the black banking economy. And, and sure, that's great. They're, they're a company that does content. They do entertainment. And if an entertainment company wants to invest in black owned banks, and then I get, you know, I get this reporter that says, oh, Bank of America just put in, you know, $300 million into black banks and, and Bank of America uh, owes more than you know probably six billion dollars in fines for mm -hmm. uh, exploiting black and brown communities during the subprime market so of course bank of america would rather put in 300 million dollars which is mm -hmm. a sneeze for bank of america yes. than actually pay up for yes. the damages that it has done so I, I do think that there are both strands here i think there are there is a good uh benevolent uh, you know, and, and you know, Killer Mike is mm -hmm. is very much in, in line with this, where he says, you know, creates a free, uh, I think it's Greenwood Bank, and uh, sees it as protest, but also racial welcome. I, I don't think it's going to be successful ultimately. I think his point, though, is, you know, solidarity and, and activism, and and I think you did, you saw that with um, mm -hmm. Trump's platinum plan and yep. the opportunity zones, where it is a uh, very Nixonian mm -hmm. um, deal to say. You know, I'm going to race bait on the one side and I'll just be very clear that this is what this president has done. And on the other side, I'm going to do a platinum, you know, plan. And what is the what is what is opportunity zones? It is tax breaks yes. for capital holders to invest in certain communities that are delineated as opportunity zones. This is not wealth for uh, black communities, it may be for a few mm -hmm. off, you know, uh, very successful already businesses, but that's about it. Wow. Okay. So I will not put you on the spot by asking you to assess the good faith or the cynicism uh, of these current efforts. Uh, let's assume that they're all in good faith, yeah. but perhaps yeah. they're but but perhaps yeah. they're misguided, right? And they're and they're unlikely to produce the results that that people purport to want. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me let me take you back to history a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Why didn't the Fair Housing Act work? 1968. Mm -hmm. 
uh, after having passed the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, they follow up with the Fair Housing Act of 68, uh, home ownership is the basis for wealth for most people. Uh, the Fair Housing Act was a repudiation of a lot of the bad stuff that came before as part of the New Deal and after. Why didn't the Fair Housing Act equalize the, the you know, close the racial wealth gap? Yeah, um, it wasn't tried. You know, this is great, Du Bois. Uh, uh, comment that I end the book on is, you know, the great, the problem with uh, American democracy is it has yet to be tried. You know, the, the problem a, with it, that, would, it would be a good idea. Yeah. yeah. The problem with the Fair Housing Act that affirmatively further the cause is we, we never actually really did integration. We didn't do reparations. We didn't put money in it. Mm -hmm. And part of it is the timing. You know, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP says in 1966, you couldn't pass the Emancipation Proclamation in the Congress at that moment. You know, uh, there was a backlash. I mean, can you imagine mm -hmm. a backlash to, you know, uh, right? So um, I, I think right now we're at a moment where people can understand what it was like to live through. And I, I was not alive at the time, but 67, 68, you have civil rights laws and then you have um, riots and protests across the country. You know, the Kerner Commission report, of course, comes out. It's the closest we ever got to truth and reconciliation and says white society is implicated in, in, the, in this problem. This is a problem that, that white society created and we have to fix it. And it's this real um, moment of, you know, um, coming to terms with the scale and scope of the problem. This is not going to go away with colorblindness. You can't just say, you know, discriminate and segregate and oppress for hundreds of years and then say, okay, now we don't see color which is essentially what those laws uh, did. And, and then there was a backlash. Um, I think then Nixon uh, rides into the White House mm -hmm. on that backlash. And, and I do think there is a George Romney, right? I, I, I point that out in the book. I spend time on George Romney because there really could have been this other uh, way forward. And um, the Republican party was split. The Democrats were ineffectual at the moment. I mean, mm -hmm. just, so much going on. And so I think it was a missed opportunity. And, and I think the focus right now, I, I do believe that we are at another inflection point. And back to your question about the cynicism versus good faith, the way I see it is not actually, you know, bad guys or good guys. I don't think anyone is sitting in some court. Some people certainly are like Mach Machiavellian. Mm -hmm. I think the power structure prefers not to lose power. Mm -hmm. the power structure, be it, a, you know, an inanimate object, and we'll choose the easiest route. It's like water is going to flow mm -hmm. to the easiest place it can, mm -hmm. it can flow. And, and I see this moment right now, which is, you know, with these protests and with this racial unrest and with a clear call to, to mm -hmm. fix these problems, um, I think JP Morgan will say, we will diversify our board. And NASDAQ will say, you must have a, a diverse, mm -hmm. you know, representative, which is good. It doesn't fix the problem of, you know, the, the, the things that the George Floyd protests were getting at, which is, you know, structural racism, and, you know, w whatever that means. And so these things get co-opted mm -hmm. and they, 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 people, I think, um, form into the thing that is the lowest hanging fruit. And then sometimes we'll stop because of a backlash or because, you know, the protests die down. People are so tired. <laughs> Right, right. So this, I mean, these are these are very provocative points that we could, you know, uh, spend a lot more time on. Uh, but let me pull out one strand of that. Again, in the book, sometimes you give the sense that the problem historically uh, mm -hmm. and with the civil rights and with the Fair Housing Act as well was that markets weren't working well. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you get the sense that even if the markets are, quote, working well, there's something inherent in the market that limits the ability of the market to promote racial equity. So do we need you know, more and better markets or is the problem relying on markets to fix this? Um, it's, yeah, right. So it's not, um, markets don't exist outside of state policy, right? So um, there is no such thing as this like, you know, utopian free market that is not state led. I mean, the, the government creates the, the essential structure of the credit market um, uh, specifically for the middle class, but, but also, you know, if you look at JP Morgan and, and, and Bank of America and the financial crisis, like 
who are the banks that survived? Well, it's the banks that got the most TARP and, and had the most capital to begin with. And how did that happen? And, and you look at a lot of state intervention there. Um, so I don't think the market is either bad or good. The market is neutral. It is the, the state-led um, programs that you put on top of that structure. And I think what we had in this country is hundreds of years of explicit race-based markets mm -hmm. uh, uh, where white was at the top and black was at the bottom. And by the way, you know, Irish was also non-white. I mean, Italian was not white. But if you look at the Irish and Italian story, right? So you go from being non-white and discriminated against by law mm -hmm. to getting an FHA loan mm -hmm. and you become white. So, so, so whiteness is really this porous substructure that's just about who gets these benefits of these, um, these credit vehicles. And I think um, you have hundreds of years of, of that. And then you have this system where we says, now we can't pay attention to race anymore. We can't uh, look at it. So I, I think that's the problem is really uh, confronting the law and, mm -hmm. and the, the the rules of the market the law codes and you know back to the patent thing right so who gets a patent and and how how are those patents uh protected by law um uh um uh, that that is a, a wealth creating mechanism who gets a mortgage and who gets that mortgage protected by law and who gets to see their property values rise mm -hmm. because you're in a neighborhood where uh that that is desirable and so i think those things have always been embedded and and uh race has, has been a way of coding uh, those those things. Right. Wow. Okay. So um, you mentioned. I want to go back to to in your talk. You mentioned uh, the role of the Supreme Court in the sort of retrenchment that resulted after the civil rights movement. Uh, can you identify any you know, one or two big significant Supreme Court decisions that you think were mm -hmm. most wrongly decided, and if they've come out the other way? Uh, you know, they might have made a difference or would have made the most difference on these issues? Oh, that's a good question. Um, two that I think are un undercovered is mm -hmm. Euclid, the Euclidean zoning, uh, 1934, Sutherland. Um, and it was very much, it seems sometimes as a anti-market, like it, it, it has a conservative justice, Sutherland, siding with government Program. Could, you, could you give a little context because I'm imagining we yes. have law students in the audience yes. who are trying yes. to remember their property yes. class, right? Yes. So. And some a lot of property classes don't teach it, but Euclid right. is, you know, essentially a city decides to zone an area and says you 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 cannot have, you know, um, uh, uh, in, industry in this area and you have to have homes in this area. And this is very much seen as government overreach by conservatives. Or we're still in the end of the Lochner era. And you know, there's all of these new government programs coming and zoning is one of them. Like, why should the government tell me what I can and can't do with my property? And that's what um, uh, zoning, this, this case, um, uh, Euclid is about. And Justice Sutherland makes this opinion that, that blesses zoning and does it under the guise of, you know, um, he says, apartment houses are basically a nuisance mm -hmm. and um, children need, you know, a certain type of uh, environment to grow up. And of course he's talking about white children um but but you know this is it's for the kids and we're going to protect them from these nuisances not just industrial businesses and, and cars but poor people and apartment buildings and and euclidean zoning um is still the way that we shape all uh, of our neighborhoods right so what neighborhood gets that highway run through it where does the bus depot go what schools um get zoned into what and how do you um what uh, restrictions are there? You know, there's this great, uh, great, not great, horrible, but uh, a fascinating illustration of uh, race now in this very um, uh, wealthy neighborhood in, I think it was near Potomac or uh, somewhere in, in near DC where they tried to just put a multifamily dwelling uh, a variance in, right? So just a few houses that could have one extra dwelling, right? So you could rent out, not Airbnb, but just rent to another family, a small part of it. And people flipped out. Um, and it, it's, of course, it's about property values, it's about schools, it's about taxes, but uh, it has a very explicit racial dimensions to it. And um, so uh, I think zone Euclid, <clears throat> the other one is, um, is the Baki case, uh, which um, upholds from I mean, Baki and Richmond, but Richmond is, is the 18, 1989, but Baki 
guts. I mean, there's a, um, uh, um, oh my goodness, um, Frederick Marshall's uh, Descent in Baki really lays out the stakes. And, you know, Baki is maybe all, we all know because we're in a university, but it upholds affirmative action. Yep. Um, but it does so uh, based only on the uh, justification of diversity mm -hmm. and student experience, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, not on righting historic wrongs. And Frederick Doug, uh, um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, Marshall, um, his dissent is that um, it is impossible that the constitution is gonna stand as a block for this country addressing historic wrong. Nothing has been changed, right? And, and so you're now blocking the use of race to right historical wrongs. And, and of course, Richmond comes, uh, you know, decade later, and there's this black capitalism program contract set aside. So we're going to give, you know, uh, certain quotas for uh, uh, black businesses, you know, for government contracting. And and uh, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor quotes Martin Luther King, uh, his, you know, just the the, mm -hmm. the pull quote from the "I Have a Dream" speech to say, you know, King wouldn't have liked, you know, this is reverse discrimination. You know, don't judge people by the color of their skin. So those two decisions made it really hard mm -hmm. to do any government programming that fixes historic wrongs. Um, so- uh, Well, that, well that, that raises <laughs> a question I think is on many people's minds, uh, especially now that we uh -huh. are on the eve of a new presidential administration. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a new Congress uh, mm -hmm. for, the next four, for the next couple of years at least. Uh, mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? Uh, the problem of resources has, mm -hmm. is at the core, you argue, of mm -hmm. so many of the ills that we mm -hmm. see with respect to race, uh, from mm -hmm. police violence, educational inequity, to uh, life expectancy. There are all kinds of problems that are tied to resources. If we want to redistribute resources, uh, how do we do it? Uh, what are the possibilities and how do we think about them? Hey, um, so uh, even despite the Supreme Court's uh, blocks on explicit race programs, although they, they can be overturned, but not likely this court, if we're talking about the next, um, uh, the horizon. Uh, fortunately, um, there's a lot of stand-ins for race. And unfortunately, because you can discriminate, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with algorithms, but um, using zip codes, using mm -hmm. just the gap in wealth, mm -hmm. um, you can target programs um, at, um, I think, housing mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, schooling, I'm talking elementary school, uh, elementary high school uh, uh, schooling are two massive um, leverage points sure. that, and, and both of those go together, obviously, but really um, focusing on wealth building for um, the, the home. So whether that's down payment assistance, I've, mm -hmm. I've talked about a Fed treasury program called the 21st Century Homestead Act, where you're buying up, you know, areas that are, you know, history of redlining and broken housing markets like Baltimore, Detroit, where you can buy a house for $5,000, but you can't get the loan to develop it, is to yeah. create a Fed program akin to the, what we saw with the, you know, um, yeah, myriads of, of uh, you know, COVID and post-crisis um, programs where you're just creating a bond, 10 years investment uh, with a federal backing and a um, uh, uh, Low low interest rate um, loan to, to to folks to redevelop that um, on schooling. I think um, integrating tax dollars and making sure that every school gets a, we don't have to like equalize test scores or anything, but you could start with equalizing resources. And um, uh, uh, we, you know we kind of know what a good school is, um, and we we tend to funnel um, money based on you know, uh, property taxes. And, and I know some places, California specifically has tried um, to get at this, but there's a lot more uh, that we can do. I mean, I, I think policy can work to change hearts and minds. I, I hesitate to change hearts and minds and then hope that they'll change policy. I think um, you can, within a generation, really um, disrupt these patterns that uh, are, you know, uh, pulling up ladders in certain communities and providing all sorts of like, you know, trampolines yeah. in other communities, yeah. right? Yeah. So let me, now these are, I mean, these are both important. These are issues that are, that are dear to my heart. Uh, let me just go back to the housing issue for a moment, mm -hmm. um, which which resonates with me personally, I will admit. So I, uh, I'm from Cleveland, which is one of those mm -hmm. cities that has seen yep. massive 
this, this investment and the, mm -hmm. you know the central city is just a, a shell of what it used mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. uh, my sister who lives here actually did buy the house next to her for 100 i mean the lot next to her for 100 dollars yeah uh, mm -hmm. and it is a yeah. Uh, it is a lot where the house was torn down because there's so many empty houses in the neighborhood. Uh, and your suggestion is that we have an infusion of money into those sorts of neighborhoods in central cities that have been abandoned uh, to try to redevelop those central cities. And then the question is, uh, how do we know that the Black people, frankly, who've been most victimized by that state of affairs, that they would actually benefit from this uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to some really savvy, large uh, real mm -hmm. estate investors who are going to come in and make a killing, uh, mm -hmm. leaving the poor people as poor now as they were before. Yeah, it's a huge, huge issue. So, you know, um, New York has done very limited programs like this. And what, what you do is you set a 10 year residency requirement. You, you live there. Um, you are you 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 don't have to limit it to former residents, mm -hmm. but you could certainly limit it to future residents. Mm -hmm. You stay there for ten years, and there's a lien on the property that gets mm -hmm. lower every year. And, and New York City did this with a couple programs that worked. You have a ten year lien, so if you sell it within a year, you have to pay back you know this much. But if you sell it within ten years, it's yours free and clear. So you have it. You have an equity um, producing thing, and the key is to do this holistically, mm -hmm. right? So so you you know you you invest in broadband you do you, i mean the new deal did this like created the suburb out of dead land mm -hmm. we can certainly do this with places that already have that cultural capital right you already have a thriving sector in certain places I, i'm not familiar with cleveland but i am with detroit I mean, detroit is a city where you you can buy a house for five thousand dollars but the private equity firms came in and bought up a ton of these places just to wait because everyone knows that at some point detroit's going to come back because there's so much there um and i think you know there you have um the the, the city being able to use eminent domain to just give the private equity firms back their five thousand dollars and take back the property you know, run broadband um, in the way that cities sort of courted Amazon with, okay, we'll build rails, we'll do broadband, we'll, you know, we have all this stuff, and then Amazon ends up going to New York because it already has all that infrastructure. Um, you know, do do that holistically, and then let the companies come. Uh, let let you know. Um, uh, there's there's a lot of sort of revival that happens. I think you know when one company comes. You know, Seattle is a perfect example of this. This is like a dead city. Microsoft moves back and then uh, Starbucks and, you know, a couple other um, big companies move back and now you can't buy a house in, in downtown Seattle anymore. And that was a 10, 15 year um, project. So I think uh, the government knows how to do this. We've done it before and um, we could do it in a way that is a, a, a not a loss. This is I'm not suggesting a congressional appropriation. I'm con suggesting a treasury bond with a Fed program that gets its money back. But you have to wait 10 years you know you, the government the thing that the government can do but the market can't is a long-term investment yeah. and just sit sit tight <laughs> and then and then you can get that back that like the fha did and how do you think about the choice though between investing in geographic areas or property which is what you're talking mm -hmm. about versus the alternative of investing in people so you can right. invest in people through a uh, you know, there's a baby bonds idea, the yep. idea that we would give people money when mm -hmm. a child is born mm -hmm. and you invest mm -hmm. in that child, uh, universal basic income, those are payments that would go to individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think about that choice between property, geography on one hand versus individual people on the other? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of a all of the above person, <laughs> you know, I, I think all of it is good. I mean, the property thing is just that you, you can kill a couple of birds with one stone here because you do have a real geographic disparity in this country right now with certain cities that are, you know, like where you are, where I am, New York, where the, the, the coastal elite cities, right? Where it's impossible to, to buy. And certain cities that are in a rapid decline. And so that geographic um, separation comes with, you know, jobs and, the, it, 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 it hurts politics, it hurts, you know, environmental, there's environmental harms. And I think this is one way to kind of kill two birds with one stone. Um, but I'm all for baby bonds. Um, UBI, depending on the, I think the devils and the details there um, uh, is good. Um, but but I, uh, I think the thing with property is that you, uh, 
you can see a domino effect because you have to fix the, the uh, school resource system too. And I think that goes a lot with property. It doesn't have to, but it does historically. Um, the equity building helps. Um, and of course the, the sort of green uh, in, environmental stuff that we, we, we really need um, uh, to work on, you know, just sustainable energy sustaining, uh, uh, or I guess retaining uh, cities, right? So creating new green infrastructure and building houses that are not the wasteful suburbs that we have currently. So let me give you, we're, we're nearing the end of our time, unfortunately, because we can talk for many more hours mm -hmm. about this. But uh, so let me couple two questions here. So mm -hmm. one is, you know, some of my uh, more conservative friends, frankly, would say that, you know, what we've been talking about is really misguided, right? You're not going to be able to build up the community unless they would say you build up the human capital uh, mm -hmm. of the people first. So what you really need, they would argue, is to improve the educational system. If you improve the educational system, that draws companies, the companies are on investment, and then you have a virtuous cycle. So mm -hmm. one question is, should education come first or not? Mm -hmm. Then the second question is, uh, what about reparations? Uh, mm -hmm. That's been something that's been debated Politically, mm -hmm. we haven't really talked about that explicitly here. Is reparations part of the solution or is that a distraction? Absolutely part of the solution. I, um, we absolutely have to be considering reparations um, because um, there's a tendency, I think, historically to um, kind of get over the past. Like, well, we're already seeing calls for unity after a, an insurrection this week, right? Just forget about it. Let's just move forward and build and and that was a problem with reconstruction is there's this rush to fix it and to be friends again that you end up sacrificing uh, the rights of the black population for you know uh, hundreds of years and um, and and that's where the land grant the initially you know where you have treasonous confederates who you know uh, um, were you know the, the options that Lincoln was considering was like do we hang them or do we take away their land. And all of a sudden they get their land back mm -hmm. and they get to deprive uh, the, the freedmen of their land. And, and you know, we do this again and again when we end the New Deal era discrimination, when we end Jim Crow, it's just like, let's just forget about it and move on and be colorblind. And remember what Martin Luther King said about the content of our character, not the color of our skin. Well, the color of people's skin obviously is not a real, you know, has no indication of, of, of who they are, but we have used that as a shortcut for all sorts of discrimination very explicitly. And so we, we need to talk about that, you know, and uh, you look at other countries and, you know, uh, what happened with the Nazis, what happened with, um, you know, apartheid is, is you, you have to have truth and then reconciliation. And I think truth uh, hasn't really been done and neither has reconciliation. And so re reparations, um, 100%. As far as what comes first, education or housing, you know, I tend to think that uh, people, given the environment that they're in, would make like, you, know, you put me in any city, I'm going to be like the people that grow up in that city. I, I, you know, I think sometimes the, 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 the theories of why, you know, racial wealth gaps exist or why people aren't, you know, succeeding in certain areas have to do with a whole bunch of people making bad decisions. And I, I don't, I don't buy that as a theory because it just doesn't have the empirical proof. I mean, look at the, you know, Raj Teddy's, uh, data and several other people who talked about the moving to opportunity, right? So, you know, you have uh, within 10 years, the kids who got to go to those better schools have all sorts of better outcomes just because you just change the neighborhood. And and the, the, the other thing, I mean, it's not just the school resources, it's also um, the freedom from violence and freedom from the trauma of, uh, uh, you know, um, a systemic poverty and that that is an emotional psychological thing that you know if you you watch so many george floyd videos that i i, I have not experienced yeah. that and i think that you cannot underestimate what a living under those i mean you certainly can i you know i think people um don't quite understand what it might be like to walk to school uh with threats of violence you know and and i think that that's um part and parcel of the geography um, conversation as well. Okay, so we're, we're holding the class yeah. late for a few minutes, but okay. I have one more so, question because the yeah. bell hasn't rung right yet. 
Can we can we address these uh, racial gaps in wealth without addressing segregation? Um, should integration be an explicit, overt, central goal, or can we focus on the wealth disparities and just let integration happen as it does, or not? Yes, I think uh, I think um, integration comes with baggage now, and so I, I think it's really difficult to just push for integration. I, I, I don't, and I don't think you have to. I just think if you can bring the wealth up people can live where they want. You don't want to be moving people forcefully, um, but it, it just doesn't have to be such a drastic difference between a black neighborhood and a white neighborhood. We still code uh, you know, the, the value of a home based on its inhabitants and very much do so as, you know, we, we put a premium on white neighborhoods and by white, you know, we're not, it's a multiracial white. Um, uh, so, so yes, I think if, if it's equally valuable to own a house in a black neighborhood and then a white neighborhood, then we fix the problem. But in this country, value has been marked to race and, and you have to disrupt that somehow. This is true, wow. So you re reminded me and then Celeste said a comments really of a, of a, a remark that, that, that uh, 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 Brian Stevenson made in, a, in mm -hmm. a conversation. I don't know if he said this publicly, but it says in the United States, uh, people focus a lot on truth and reconciliation. Uh, but part of the problem is that many people want to just jump to the reconciliation mm -hmm. part and they want to skip over the truth part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and one of your many contributions here mm -hmm. is to mm -hmm. focus us on the truth part. Uh, mm -hmm. And the truth part is really essential. Uh, yeah. I think we would agree to the reconciliation uh, yeah. and that you're telling the truth about some longstanding enduring problems mm -hmm. that have always been an impediment uh, mm -hmm. to the society that we need to be. Uh, and I so hope that your insights and expertise and leadership and courage on these issues can help us to chart the way forward uh, as we try yet again uh, to address what has been America's fault line. So thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to continuing this conversation. Likewise. Thank you so much.